I grew up in a round house in rural Wisconsin. My father designed it, and it's actually 36-sided. The builder was very skeptical that all of these pieces would go together in the end, but my father measured it many times, and the math worked out. In high school, I was very musical. I played in the band, sang in the choir, and played the piano. I also had the bad haircut that everyone seems to have in high school. <laughs> I got good grades and was involved in many extracurricular activities, including forensics and Odyssey of the Mind. I was your pretty standard overachiever. I also grew up around airplanes. My father, grandfather, both engineers, both had pilot's licenses. So when I turned 16, it seemed only natural that my dad would ask if I wanted to learn to fly. And after my first lesson, I was hooked. This is me at 17 after an aerobatic lesson. Yes, that is a letter jacket, <laughs> but it's for band, not sports. <laughs> and although it was the grunge era, really I just lucked out that baggy and plaid was in fashion. Nearly every year, my family would go to the EAA Air Show in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I remember as a very small child sleeping in the baggage compartment of the airplane, and then when I got bigger, sleeping in a tent next to it. Most families, when they go on family vacation, pile into the minivan. In my family, we would pile into a small four-seater airplane and pack our luggage around us like a human-sized game of Tetris. Then we would sit still with no restroom for up to five hours. Needless to say, flying in a small airplane is not as glamorous as some people think. <laughs> I was also fortunate to have a full woodworking and metalworking shop in a barn in the woods. My father had nearly every tool I could possibly want there, and I made many a school project there. Whenever he needed to fix something, he would grab my brother or I to hold the flashlight and to hand him tools. My family was very egalitarian. That's actually why I was named Robin, because the name could belong to a boy or a girl. In my family, you were expected to be a well-rounded adult. Both my brother and I learned how to cook and clean and fix our first cars. So when I went off to college, it made perfect sense that I became a mechanical engineer. I'm actually fourth generation mechanical engineer, and almost no one is fourth generation anything these days. Both my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather all went to school for mechanical engineering. I didn't have to be one, but it made sense. Evidently, my father was better at corrupting both my brother and I than my mom. She was a German and English teacher. She tried. And yet, despite all of the smiles in my pictures, I was not happy. I had a tremendous amount of anxiety, especially in college. I had chronic insomnia, and I remember having anxiety attacks, especially around finals time. I also was very lonely. I had very few friends. Because despite all of the advantages I had growing up, I still did not feel like I fit in. Somewhere along the way, I had absorbed the message that engineer does not equal female. No one explicitly told me this. I probably absorbed it from the world around me, because all of my role models growing up for how to be an engineer were male, my father and grandfather. And I picked this up from the media that I consumed. My parents did restrict the media. This was back in the 90s when it was still possible to do that. <laughs> But one show they did allow us to watch was Star Trek. <laughs> Spock, Scotty, and Geordi, the scientists and engineers, were some of my favorite characters. But because I had absorbed this message that engineer does not equal female, I was constantly monitoring myself for behavior that I deemed too feminine. I was afraid it would undermine my credibility. And if being less feminine had been my natural personality, then I wouldn't have felt that tension. But I wasn't. I was constantly holding back and suppressing myself. In fact, in one of my first jobs, I had a nickname, Bones. 
Bones is a TV character who solves crimes by looking at Bones. She's highly educated, but her personality is very cool and removed and analytical, almost robotic. The actress is gorgeous, and the character is brilliant, so I really didn't mind the comparison. <laughs> But it did get me thinking about how I was coming across at work. At that time, I had also taken up salsa dancing, and many of my coworkers could not imagine me, Bones, dancing salsa. Around this time, I also started paying attention to my coworkers and how they were behaving. And there was one particular phrase that really stuck out for me. Many of my coworkers said that working on a project was like giving birth. And at first, I was annoyed by this. How would my mostly male colleagues know what it's like to give birth? <laughs> but then I realized a lot of them were fathers, so they might know something. And at the time, I hadn't given birth yet either, so. I also noticed that we engineers tend to personify inanimate objects. We'll give our projects names and treat them almost like pets or children. We even talk about their feelings how the project's not happy today, or it didn't like that test, or the computer is grumpy. And it even goes so far as to call new parts and prototypes cute or adorable, even if they are not remotely fuzzy. <laughs> and as I thought about this phrase, that working on a project is like giving birth, I realized that my colleagues, mostly male, were using very feminine language to describe the supposedly masculine domain of engineering. And then it hit me that my female body is designed to take the information in DNA and bring it into physical form. And that was almost exactly what I was doing with my mind as an engineer. I was taking information, a concept, and bringing it into physical form. For example, we talk about you conceive of an idea. In engineering, this often happens when two very disparate ideas come together and form a new one in a new and unexpected way. Next, we have to give that idea a physical form. We have to give birth to it. This is often called a proof of concept or a prototype. And once we have that prototype, we have to nurture it. With children, there are a lot of repetitive tasks. You have to feed them, you have to clothe them, and you have to bathe them. And it's similar with engineering. Once we have that prototype, there's a lot of drawings that I have to make, a lot of computer models, and a lot of meetings. <laughs> we also have to collaborate. Raising children doesn't just take parents. It takes grandparents, aunts and uncles, neighbors, and teachers. And modern engineering is highly collaborative. One engineer will work on one small part of an airplane, and then they will have to collaborate with all of the engineers who work on the connecting parts. And then those parts might be manufactured on the other side of the planet by someone in a different time zone who speaks a different language. We also have to help those parts mature and grow. You would never send a child straight into the major leagues of baseball. Instead, they start out in t-ball, and then move on, to the min or move on to Little League, and then the minors are college. And it's a similar kind of process in engineering. A prototype part will go through many different iterations before it's ready to be launched. And each one of those iterations has to be tested and evaluated, both on the computer and in real life. And once you've done all your homework, and you think you've prepared it for everything that it could possibly encounter, you have to give it the keys and set it out into the world. <laughs> you have to launch your product. As an engineer, this is a very nerve-wracking process. We think we know it'll solve a problem for the customer and that the customer will love it and that they will use it in a way that we expect. But we're never completely sure. Sometimes they could use it in a way we didn't foresee. And then it could come back broken or injured or in the case of this LED, burnt out. So then we have to bring it back in and investigate and figure out what went wrong and change something and go through the whole process again and put it back out there in the world. And this cycle 
can be repeated many different times throughout the lifetime of a product. Now, what I'm talking about here is actually the creative process. And I didn't invent the creative process. I could use whatever language I want to describe it. I could use more feminine language, like giving birth and nurturing, or I could use more corporate language, like prototype and research and development. It doesn't really matter what language I use to describe the process. It's something that all of us have access to as human beings. So as I thought about this realization, that the core of engineering is actually girly, I realized how much I was holding myself back, how much I was censoring, how much I was playing into the stereotype that engineer equals masculine, and that doing this was exhausting. So slowly over time, I started relaxing and being more myself. I started smiling more, I started laughing more at work, I started telling more jokes. And I also stopped worrying so much about what I was wearing at work. If I felt like it, I'd wear a dress, so long as I didn't have to go on the manufacturing floor or work on a prototype in the shop, it didn't really matter in an office. And more importantly, I started showing more enthusiasm for the job. One of my favorite parts about being an engineer is when I get that very first prototype of something I've been working on so hard, I would get so excited that I would yell out, babies! <laughs> In fact, I did this so frequently that one of the machinists, when he would hand me a new part, would say, babies. <laughs> and then I would go, babies! <laughs> of course, making all of these changes over time, I was nervous that there would be some pushback. I was afraid I would get a dirty look, or some comment under the breath, or even some negative feedback on my review that I was somehow being unprofessional. But guess what happened? Nothing. There was no negative pushback for me being more myself at work. In fact, the exact opposite happened. All of my working relationships improved. Because I was more relaxed and was more myself, people were more willing to come up to me and approach me with new ideas and to collaborate on new things. And more importantly, I was more willing to say the phrase, I don't know. Previous to this realization, I had been terrified of saying I don't know for fear of reinforcing the stereotype that women are not good at engineering. But as I looked at the men around me, I realized they said I don't know all the time, and none of them lost prestige or respect. Being more willing to say I don't know not only improved my working relationships, but it also helped me grow much faster as an engineer. And now I have my own company, which I founded with my brother. We make solar-powered jewelry that has tiny little twinkling LEDs incorporated into the design. I love this because I get to use all aspects of my personality. Not only do I get to use my technical acumen, but I also get to use my artistic side. And I get to use my business and strategic planning skills, as well as learn about marketing and sales. And one of my favorite parts is I get to teach. We also make soldering kits and teach children and adults how to put them together. I love it, especially when teens, boys or girls, finally get it put together and get it light up. I love seeing that light of love for technology spark in them and for them to see that there's no split between art and science. And now, unlike when I was younger, it is easier than ever for me to find role models in science and technology who look a lot like me. All I need to do is a simple internet search, and I can turn up dozens of profiles of women and people of color doing amazing things. In fact, recently, there was a Twitter handle that went viral along these lines. It was called, I Look Like an Engineer. And it was started by this woman, Isis Anjali, who works for One Login in San Francisco. She and several other engineers from her department were grabbed for an ad campaign for their company. And then that campaign was plastered all over the city. She was rather shocked by the comments that her ad specifically got on the internet. Many people said, 
that she didn't look like an engineer. She must have been a model that the company hired. Well, she pushed back and started this Twitter handle, I look like an engineer, and encouraged others who did not fit the stereotypical straight white male to post pictures of themselves. Within hours, there were hundreds of people posting pictures of both men and women and people of color doing amazing things in science and technology. So my challenge to you is to ask yourself, what are you noticing? And more importantly, what are you missing? Because this feminine language inside of engineering was there all along, but I didn't see it until I started looking for it. And once I noticed this gendered language, I could ask myself, did it need to be? Because the gendered language itself isn't the problem. That's simply how English is structured. But once I started noticing it and asking this question, it pointed at my unconscious assumptions that I had by the language I was using. And this works the other way around, that by changing my language, that also changed my unconscious assumptions. And now I can proudly say that I look like an engineer. Thank you. Thank you.